From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David Weston. We're going to start with a check on the markets and turn right now to Abigail Doolittle. So, Abigail, it looks at some softness in the equity markets, but the NASDAQ is what really jumps out at me. That's certainly the case, David. The NASDAQ at big tech, those mega caps, really underperforming on the day. And for the first time in a really long time, at least to me, it doesn't just feel like the one side of the reflation versus the stay-at-home safety. Uh, trade it actually sells like big feels like big tech is selling off now a piece of it is certainly Apple we did get news uh, via the 13 F's recently that Berkshire Hathaway Warren Buffett's firm uh, did trim their Apple position it's still their top holding but nonetheless maybe a cautionary move uh, the stock is certainly taking it or is down for some reason that seems to be the one fundamental thing that really stands out back below its 50 day moving average the worst day since January 29th so since that stock has a bigger uh, uh, waiting to the NASDAQ and the New York Fang Index and some of those other tech indexes. That's really where we have the weakness. It's going to be interesting to watch this play out. The other factor, though, David, is the one that we've been talking about, and that is the fact that we do have rates higher. Today, keeping with the risk off tones, rates are actually lower, so bonds are rallying a little bit. But over the last five days, you have this huge backup for rates. Yesterday, the 10 year yield back above, oh, if you can believe it, 1.3%, which historically is very low, but in, over the last year seems very high so we may be getting a signal that that level is a you know a cause for repricing of risk the fear of inflation versus that healthy reflation yeah if it happens then you have to watch out with the equities thank you so much to abigail doolittle for that report on the markets we're going to turn now to that continuing power crisis in texas as some three million people are still without power and many may be for several more days we turn 10 democratic congressmen have written a letter to ERCOT, that's the texas energy reliability council demanding some answers and we welcome now one of those congressmen. He is Congressman Al Green, whose district includes a good part of Houston. So, Congressman, thank you so much for being back with us. You wrote this letter to ERCOT. You demanded answers by today. Do you think you're going to get some answers today? Well, thank you for having me on. I certainly hope that we'll get the answers. I'm not sure what ERCOT will do right away. I was on a phone call just recently where we had some explanations given as to why we are suffering some of these dire circumstances in Texas. As you well know, roads have been closed. We have blackouts, rolling blackouts that are, were supposed to last hours that are now lasting days. Uh, we have persons in nursing homes, senior facilities that are in need of electricity. I just got a call recently from a prison, from a prison where in they're asking for help, they need water. So there are emergencies and we do need answers. And I'm proud to be a part of the letter. Uh, Mr. Castro is the actual uh, author of the letter, and I'm proud to co-sponsor the letter with him. Now, we've seen some data here at Bloomberg that suggests that things may not be getting all that much better in terms of the amount of power being produced. If anything, it might have gone back a little bit over the last 24 hours. One of the questions you ask of ERCOT in your letter, uh, uh, Mr. Castro does, that you signed on to, is what's Plan B? Uh, do you have any sense it, whether there is a Plan B? I do not get a sense that there is a Plan B. Uh, I get a sense that the management of the flow of electricity across the grid has become a challenge. And uh, because there is not nearly enough, there ha will have to be these blackouts. And uh, ordinarily, we would, uh, in a state the size of Texas, be able to move uh, our electrical power from one part of the state that's not being impacted adversely to another part that is. But we have the entire state that is adversely impacted. And uh, when you have a state and a region with the same problem, uh, it's difficult to do things other than what's being done. But the question is, how prepared were we for this eventuality? Uh, there seems to be uh, a, a need that has not been properly diagnosed. And we need to get to the bottom of what should have been done and why it was not done and who was responsible for getting it done. Uh, it gives us a sense in your district, you mentioned some of the, the really inconvenience and even more than that, some danger being experienced by people down there. Are there things that you can do or the government can do to try to alleviate some of the problems, whether it's heat or power or water? Well, there are things that we can do, uh, but they still have... Uh, there's still an adverse impact being felt by people. For example, we can have these rolling blackouts, 
but you still have someone who will be without power. Uh, we have now water having to be boiled in Houston and in Fort Bend County, which is a part of my district as well. Uh, we have these stories from people who will leave home to go to one hotel, and uh, they discover that the power is out at the hotel. So you go to another hotel, the power is out at that hotel. Go to a relative's home, the power is out at the relative's home. Literally, that has happened to a person that uh, I'm familiar with. So the, the challenges are great, and uh, the outlook is not good as long as the weather stays within this freezing range. Our hope is that we'll get better weather, which means that we'll get some different results. Do you have any sense of the role, if any, that the renewable energy uh, area played in this? Because we've heard from some people who say part of the problem is you went too fast to wind and solar. I've heard this as well, <clears throat> uh, and I respect the person, one of the persons who said this. I consider the person an honorable person. Uh, and the allegation is that with the wind, you have uh, the cold uh, such that it impacts the turning of the blades for uh, the wind towers, uh, literally frozen up. And you can't generate power unless those blades can turn. Well, um, I believe that you have to solve problems along the way. And uh, this is a problem that has to be addressed. But it does not mean that we should step back now from what is our future. Our future is not in fossil fuels. Uh, it is a finite fuel source. We have to move to other forms of energy. Uh, it is of necessity that we will do it. And we need not allow a minor setback to be anything other than an opportunity for us to come back better. Yeah. Perhaps we can use the term build back better. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and, and some people have observed that Canada and parts of the northern United States have wind turbines, and they've winterized them. That can be done if you invest the money, which maybe is something that will have to be considered in Texas. Let me make a turn now to something else. You were a member of the House Financial Services Committee. There's a big uh, hearing tomorrow on what happened with GameStop and Robinhood. Give us your sense about what you're looking for to come out of that hearing. What are the questions you're asking? Well, there's some significant questions. I will submit more than 20 questions for the record, and uh, these questions will be made public at an appropriate time. But one of the uh, key questions, uh, a, a gravamen, if you will, that has to be dealt with is, uh, did Citadel have uh, undue influence on Robin Hood's uh, restrictions? Uh, Citadel has a relationship with Robin Hood. I want to know more about that relationship. Uh, I want to know to what extent that relationship accorded Citadel some undue influence, if it did. Uh, this is important. But I'm also very much interested in how the order flows are processed. Uh, does Citadel have reason to process principal order flows from Citadel ahead of Robin Hood's order flows? And I, I must say this is an area that... Uh, intrigues me because Citadel has the ability to engage in high-frequency trading. Um, and I want to know if this puts those retail investors from Robin Hood at some sort of unfair, unethical disadvantage. Uh, this, this may open yeah. up a can of worms that will necessitate more than, than one look. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot to be examined, and uh, I think that uh, tomorrow will open the door, yeah. and we'll see where we'll go after the door is open. And as I'm sure you know, it's a very complicated area that you get into. You're going to hear from Ken Griffin, the head of Citadel, but there are two Citadels, right? There's a Citadel that's the hedge fund. There's a Citadel that's Citadel Securities that cleared a lot of the trades, and the relationship between those two is not clear, at least in my mind, a lot to find out. Let me ask you, though, when we look at the, the members of the House Financial Services Committee, very few actually are involved in the equity markets, and that's good in a sense because that means there's no insider trading or something. On the other hand, does it put you at a disadvantage because you don't deal in the equity markets as regularly and it is a very complicated area? Well, we don't deal in it regularly. Some of us have lost money in it. Uh, I don't know whether that means that we, uh, <laughs> we, 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 we're we in, uh, inappropriately dealing in it. Uh, some of us have made money in it. Uh, so uh, I can only say this, that uh, we have people that are gifted and talented. And uh, we are 
making sure that we understand the language that we have to deal with. You mentioned uh, Citadel Securities and the venture capital side, uh, but uh, they do have a common nexus, mm -hmm. and that is a common person. Uh, so we will probably want to know about some of that type of engagement. But we also uh, are making sure that we understand market flow, that we understand the bid-ask spread. Uh, these, these things are not incomprehensible. It just uh, takes a person some time to acquaint himself with the language. You know, I'm a lawyer. We have our own language. Uh, if I ask you what, um, uh, what uh, uh, well, let's not do that one. I was, I was thinking of something that is X-rated, so I won't ask. <laughs> but my point, <laughs> my, 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 point, my point is that yeah. each, each of these professions has yeah. its own language, yeah. and we just have to delve into yeah. it. Uh, but that's all we have to do. Well, race ipsa loquitur there. I'll throw one out for you. It's been a while since I've been ah, to law school, but I remember that one. Yeah, okay. what, what a great doctrine. That's yes. right. Okay. Yes. Thank Things you. sometimes speak for themselves. <laughs> that's right. Exactly right. Thank you so much to Congressman Al Green. He's Democrat of Texas. Coming up, we're going to return. To, we're going to stay with the Texas power crisis and what it means for President Biden's green agenda with Bill Richardson, former U.S. Energy Secretary. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. For Bloomberg First Word News, we go now to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. The European Commission secured 300 million additional COVID-19 vaccines. The commission has been under scrutiny for a vaccine rollout deemed underwhelming. Here's the commission's president. The increased spread of the new COVID-19 variants first identified in the United Kingdom, South Africa and Brazil are a potential paradigm shift in the global fight against um, COVID-19. We need to further upscale mass production of new vaccines, but also of existing vaccines. In addition to the Moderna contract, the EU's executive arm finalized an agreement with Pfizer and BioNTech for 200 million more doses. President Biden says he invoked a federal law to speed up production of the coronavirus vaccine. The president told a CNN town hall meeting last night that Moderna and Pfizer agreed to sell more doses of the vaccine to the United States faster than planned. Last week, the government announced there would be enough doses by the end of July to inoculate all American adults. Utility operators struggling with that deep freeze in Texas have a warning. Those rolling blackouts could keep parts of the state in darkness for days. The power cuts were implemented for a second day in a row to prevent the collapse of electric networks. Outages spread last night to more states, including Arkansas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Thanks so much, Mark. I want to stay on that story of the continuing power crisis in Texas. It is raising some fundamental questions about U.S. energy policy and the Biden administration's plans to move us rapidly toward green alternatives. For the broader picture, we welcome now Bill Richardson, former Secretary of Energy under President Clinton. Mr. Richardson has also served as governor of New Mexico and U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. Mr. Ambassador, thank you so much for being with us. I left off the fact you were a, a congressman as well, but there's too long a resume there. So thanks for, for being with us. So give us your sense right now of what is going on in Texas and how it might affect overall U.S. energy policy? Well, we have to understand that Texas has a very decentralized grid, uh, unregulated energy, but it's our major producer. And, you know, we're neighbors, Texas, New Mexico. We do a lot of uh, natural gas, uh, shale together. So uh, what I think needs to happen is, one, yes, ERCOT, I think those congressmen are right. They need to come up with some answers. Uh, what is plan B? Uh, better information to the public. I mean, this affected 4 million human beings in Texas. But I think as for overall energy policy, I think President Biden's in the right direction. I think the answer is to move towards renewable energy. Although at the same time, I think you can't eliminate natural gas, you can't eliminate coal, you can't eliminate uh, petroleum. I mean, this is the lifeblood of many states. But what I think needs to happen, David, is one, 
more renewable energy investments. Uh, for instance, what happened in Texas? I think the president is right to say we have to improve our electric grid, not just bridges and highways, but our electricity grid with coal protection. I think that some of these companies that invested in coal protection, in water for some of the coal and natural gas facilities, uh, protect from this climate change, which is climate change, the freezing. So I think the president's in the right direction. You know, I don't agree with everything, the Green New Deal, because, uh, but I do agree that the shift has to be towards solar, wind, and I believe that uh, to blame solar and wind and uh, as some politicians are doing now is, is not the answer. I think there has to be a concentrated national energy strategy that moves towards renewable energy. Uh, and Mr. Ambassador, I want to return to that just a moment, but I'm sorry, I have to interrupt us on a sad note here. Rush Limbaugh died today at the age of it says something that's wrong. After a battle, we knew he was been battling, battling with lung cancer at the age of 70. That was announced by Fox News, citing a report from the family. We know he was a giant in talk radio. You could agree with him, disagree with him, but he sure made a big difference in this country over the course of his career. So I'm sorry to interrupt us with that sad note, Mr. Ambassador. Let's go back, though, if we can, to what you were talking about. A lot of people jumped pretty quickly on the renewables as part of the cause of the problem in Texas. That is, say, specifically those wind turbines that apparently froze, couldn't rotate. I've heard very conflicting things because I've also seen some projections from ERCOT saying, actually, we're getting more energy in Texas out of, out of wind turbines than was projected at this point. Do you have a sense of the truth of that? Well, 23% of energy uh, in Texas comes from uh, uh, renewable, from wind. And wind has operated well. The cost is going down, the technology gets better, the same with solar. Uh, but I think ideologically, some politicians say, oh, you know, it's a Green New Deal. It's wind that's the power. No, what affected, what was affected in, in, in Texas was coal plants, natural gas plants. I mean, just also in New Mexico, the Permian Basin with Texas was affected. Some of the drilling has stopped uh, because we don't have in the coal plants in Texas enough water. And, and, and you need investments in coal protection in the grid. And so I think this is a national problem. It could happen in another state. It's not just gonna happen in Texas, the supreme power. So I think the future is renewable. I think it's, we stick with that, but also improve our grid. But don't say that you're gonna eliminate uh, natural gas. I think you can do shale and fracking with strong and good regulation, environmental protection. You're not gonna eliminate that. That's not gonna happen. We talked with your successor as Energy Secretary yesterday, Dan Briette, who worked for President Trump, and he said part of what we need is we need investment in infrastructure for storage, for things like solar and wind, that in fact those are very efficient, as you know, very effective ways of generating power, but we don't have the right way to store it yet. Uh, is he right, and can we get that? Yeah, he is right. That, that, there's no question we need uh, better storage capacity, uh, but this is going to be a national strategy. Uh, but at the same time, you don't downgrade uh, wind and solar uh, because they're getting better technology, they're cheaper, uh, they're great job producing green jobs for Americans. You know, in Texas, there are a lot of green jobs. It's not just natural gas and oil jobs. So, uh, but yeah, storage, but also infrastructure improvements, coal protection facilities, uh, ways that we integrate the grid you know, Texas has chosen to be uh, an independent grid, fine. But I think there should be some kind of integration uh, and, and a little more national regulation to ensure that these uh, ERCOTs, uh, you, you, you can't just blame them, David. They're being blamed for everything. But they got to get information out better. They got to answer what happened. I mean, this was a, this is a national strategy uh, that needs to be developed. It's not just Texas, even though Texas is our number one energy producer. We've learned a lot about uh, the Texas uh, the different approach to energy. Is there anything the federal government could do could, to make them integrate with the rest of the country when it comes to the power grid? Well, you can't make them. A lot of these uh, regulations are state regulations, and we know Texas is very independent, and they're major producers to energy in our country. Uh, so Texans need to make these decisions. But I think 
uh, when it comes to energy policy, I think if there's uh, a shift, uh, a recognition that we have to move towards renewable, we have to develop the grid better, the infrastructure better. We maybe have to integrate the FERC, some of these energy uh, uh, entities that regulate energy closer to Texas, maybe not fully take it over. I know Texans don't want to have uh, their energy decided nationally, but look, 4 million human beings lost their uh, energy and, and a lot of poor people died. I mean, it's it's not good what happened. So there's got to be a national strategy and Texas should uh, be part of that national strategy instead of, instead of saying, well, we're going to do it ourselves and we're going to mm -hmm. fix our own problem. That's what I would Mr. Besser, always great to have you. Thank you for being here. That's Bill Richardson, former Energy Secretary and New Mexico Governor. And we want to repeat the report that Rush Limbaugh has passed away at the age of 70 after battling lung cancer. It was announced by Fox News. As we know, he was a legendary afternoon talk radio show host, really almost created a genre. Rush Limbaugh has passed away at the age of 70. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. It's time now for our stock of the hour. We're looking at the cannabis seller Sundial. Shares are getting crushed today. Emma Chandra has the explanation. It has to do with the shelf registration, as I understand, Emma. Yeah, that's absolutely right, David. So we're seeing Sundial shares falling at some 16% today. And this seems to be investors concerned about the risk of dilution that could come uh, from that shelf registration. Uh, shelf registration is essentially a filing with the SEC from a company allowing them to make what would basically be a secondary offering at a future date, no specified date. And what's interesting with Sundial is that they made this filing for $1 billion. Uh, that is a lot. That's a big number given the market cap of the company is some 3.2 billion dollars so what they've done is that now allows them over the next three years should they want to they can sell stock warrants preferred stock or a combination of that uh, to that value should they want to in the next three years of course some investors don't like that dilution risk and that's why they're getting out uh, today but it's interesting that it's coming at this time of course because we have uh, the house hearing tomorrow on capitol hill into gamestop and sundial was one of those pot stocks uh, that yeah. saw its share price get pushed up uh, by that retail investor craze and this may be a way of them banking uh, in yeah. the future that they might be able uh, to make a share sale hard to resist cashing in on that high stock price thanks so much to emma chandra this is balance of power on bloomberg television and on radio i was very worried for a variety of reasons about the prospects for new york city i am much more concerned uh, today after the catalyst uh, to exit that uh, COVID uh, repre represented. That, of course, was former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers expressing his doubts about the recovery of New York City from the pandemic and resultant economic downturn. We welcome now someone who wants to take on that very challenge. Before becoming a candidate for mayor for New York, Sean Donovan served as Secretary of Housing and Herb Urban Development in the Obama administration. And before that, ran housing in the administration of New York Mayor Mike Bloomberg, the founder and majority shareholder of our parent company. Mr. Donovan, thank you so much for being with us. Let me ask you why you do want this job. Why do you think you could turn it around? Because it doesn't look too pretty right now well david uh you just had larry summers on i think he would tell you and and president obama president biden mike bloomberg would tell you there's no one in this race who has the deeper and broadest experience in crisis that i do i was housing commissioner in this city in the wake of 9 11 i was housing secretary in the midst of the worst housing crisis of our lifetimes when Sandy hit our shores, President Obama asked me to lead the entire federal recovery effort. And because no good deed goes unpunished, he asked me to lead the $4 trillion federal budget. Three weeks into that, Ebola emerged, and I was side by side in the situation room with Dr. Fauci, all of our leaders across government, making sure a global health crisis didn't become a pandemic that cost tens of thousands of New Yorkers their lives. So. New Yorkers want a, a public servant, not a politician, and they want someone who really understands what it means to lead through crisis, and that's who I am. So let's skip over the messy little details about getting nominated and getting elected and things like that. Let's put you in the office. 
what's the first thing you do? What's your first 100 days? We know what the problems are. We've got tax base problems. We've got crime problems. We've got a lot of small businesses going out of business. Where do you start? Well, first of all, we need a mayor who won't demonize and divide New York, but bring everyone together. I would first commit to being the mayor for all New Yorkers. Second, we have to understand that there's no path to recovery without getting the virus and our health uh, under control. I would not only uh, make sure that we were ramping up uh, vaccines and other testing uh, and contact tracing if we're still in the midst of this pandemic. If not, I would make sure not only every single New Yorker, but the entire world knows that we're the safest uh, place to do business um, and, to, and to live. That's why I've made a safest cities commitment that is the beginning of rebuilding 500,000 jobs uh, in New York City. And it's why I would make sure that we're using every avenue, not just to make sure New York City is safe, but to make sure everyone knows it so that people will come back to work, come back to live here, and that we can rebuild our tourism, arts, and culture and, and drive our economy back to where it should be. Well, I was going to ask about that specifically, tourism, because people may underestimate the extent that really drives the economy of New York. Right now, I mean, tourists basically can't come because they got nowhere to go. But there also is a perception that the, the city's in decline and the crime rate really is an issue, isn't it, for tourism? Well, look, I, I learned this from Mike Bloomberg. I learned it from the best mayors across the country and across the world that I've worked with. I'm unique in this race because I have worked with mayors across the globe to tackle these kinds of problems. And let's recognize that in this economy, talent decides where it wants to live and companies and capital follow. If you believe that as I do, quality of life is the single most important tool that a mayor has to be able to make sure that we're driving job growth and economic development. That's why I have the most comprehensive uh, public safety plan of any of the candidates in the race. It's also why my experience in dramatically reducing homelessness um, and other challenges we see across this city would be put to work to make sure that we actually make our streets not just safe, but actually places that people wanna be, bring our restaurants back to life. Part of this also, it, we have to recognize, we need a mayor who can get the help we need from Washington to do all those things. No one in this race has the same relationships I do, not just with President uh, Biden and Vice President Harris, nearly every single advisor in the, uh, in the Biden White House is not only a former colleague, but a close friend of mine. These are folks I can work with very effectively and members of Congress to bring the help that we need to revitalize the city's economy. You talked about uh, attracting and holding on to talent. Another thing that talent doesn't like to do is pay taxes. Uh, what does that mean for tax rates as a practical matter? We see a lot of people from Wall Street really taking a hard look at places like Florida, in part, in large part, because of the tax situation. Well, look, David, New Yorkers want results, not rhetoric. And what they know is that President Obama trusted me to lead the $4 trillion budget of this country. People forget that when we came into office, we had the worst budget deficits, deficit since World War II, and we were able to bring it down faster than any time since World War II, while still making big investments in growing jobs out of the Great Recession, in investing in infrastructure, um, in, in clean technology, so many different things that we need to do in New York City. So I'm the only one in this race with the deep experience to know how to get our budget under control and to do it in a way that we don't uh, make New York even less affordable than it's been with our taxes and, and other, other challenges. I, I've, I'm the only one who's really put out a detailed plan. We need to do three big things. Get the help that we deserve from Washington, DC. Remember, New York sends $23 billion more each year to Washington than we get back in return in services. That needs to change under a mayor who can actually get the help we need. Second. We need a mayor who's actually managed the uh, huge budgets and knows how to make sure we get to things like a real hiring freeze, getting healthcare costs under control, and, and really demanding more efficiency and innovation in government. And then third, we need to make sure that we continue to invest in things that will make the economy grow. 
quality of life and our educational system, which I have the most comprehensive detailed plans for as well. Uh, you can't do it alone, and it may require more even than Washington. That is to say, you need the business community to really support. Uh, some might say that under the most recent, the current administration, there hasn't been a great relationship between the mayor and the business community in New York. What can you do to enlist the business community to help you get done what needs doing? Well, I think that's a, a diplomatic way of, of putting it. And, and let's be clear, I think the current mayor has demonized and divided New York. Um, a hallmark of my career, whether it's working under Mayor Bloomberg or all eight years in the Obama cabinet, is being able to build public-private partnerships. Look, I grew up in this city in the 1970s and 80s. My dad is an immigrant who came to New York, started a company, and man, ran it his entire life. This is personal to me. I saw what New York City looked like in the 70s and 80s. It, that watching the Bronx burn actually lit a fire in me to go to work in public service. I came back after school and started rebuilding neighborhoods across New York City. I fundamentally understand that we need everyone at the table if we're gonna rebuild this city. We need a mayor for all New Yorkers, not someone who's gonna demonize and divide us. So that's who I am. That's who I've always been in my career. And it's personal to me, David. So, so, Sean, I said put aside the messy little details about getting nominated elected. Let's talk about those details just for a moment. What's it like campaigning in a virtual world, a world of social distancing? How do you do that? Well, look, uh, you got to be safe, first and foremost. Some of, my, uh, some of my fellow candidates haven't been doing that and have uh, come down with COVID. We need to make sure safety is first. Second of all, we need to really adapt our strategies to be able to, to reach folks. You know, one of the things about Zoom is you can get up to a lot of forums all over the city and draw New Yorkers independent uh, of where you are. So it has its downsides, but it definitely has its upsides in being able to reach people effectively. But the last thing I would just say is it's gonna take a team that really understands how to, how to do this. And one of the things I'm proudest of We've built the most talented team in the entire race. Uh, we've hired real talent coming directly off the Biden campaign who understand what it means to use the latest tools with texting, <clears throat> texting and other technology to do distributed organizing and reach folks. You really have to be nimble and understand today's technology to be able to win a race like this. That's the team that we've built. Okay, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. That's Sean Donovan. He's Democratic candidate for mayor of the city of New York. Coming up, a new era at the WTO. The World Trade Organization gets its first female and African leader. We discuss the tough job ahead for the former Nigerian finance minister with Rufus Yerksa. He's former deputy director of the WTO. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The World Trade Organization has a new director general, Ngozi Okonjo Iweala. For a perspective on what this means for the organization, we welcome now Rufus Yerksa, who served as WTO deputy director general. He is now president of the National Foreign Trade Council. So, Mr. Ambassador, thank you for being here. It strikes me that, among other things, this is the first African and the first woman to head the WTO. What does that mean? Well, thank you, David. Good to be with you. Yeah, it, it is. Obviously, she's an historic choice. Uh, you know, the Africans were not large participants in the global trading system really until about the 1990s or early 2000s. Uh, and obviously, Nigeria being the biggest economy in, in Africa, you know, is, is uh, very proud of this choice. But, you know, I think she's a groundbreaker in a lot of respects. She's a uh, She's a woman, obviously, and that's the first. There's been one woman deputy, but never, never a, 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 a director general. And she brings with her both the experience of, you know, the development economist working a long career in the in the World Bank, uh, who understands the developing world, but also, you know, somebody who understands uh, major issues of trade and finance very well. She's a tough cookie. She's a very, very strong. Uh, personality and somebody who I think will play effectively in the role, which is to, you know, push the members towards um, getting deals and getting movement in, in what is vitally needed is to move the 
WTO system forward. Well, exactly. Talk about how tough a cookie she needs to be because there were issues raised, certainly by the Trump administration, but you said that it wasn't unique to the Trump administration about the need for reform. What sorts of reform does she need to get done? Can she do it? Yeah, I mean, obviously, she's got to try to find an agenda that is going to uh, work for, you know, the vast majority of the key players in the in the system. And, you know, that obviously includes the U.S. and Europe and Japan and others, but also how do you deal with China? Because many of the pressures will come to kind of reform the rules to make it the WTO more relevant with respect to uh, some of China's practices. But I see other big challenges for the system that she'll have to take on besides that one, which is a significant one. Obviously, digital trade and the digital economy, um, global trade and health, because, you know, the effects of the pandemic and the kinds of measures countries put into place that were probably counterproductive. But how do we have better cooperation to deal with global health problems? And a big, big one is climate change, David, mm. because now, you know, the Biden administration is going to want to push forward with the Paris Agreement. A number of countries want to figure out how you develop trading rules that make the WTO system able to uh, uh, approve some kinds of, you know, border adjustments for carbon tax systems, which are probably going to come eventually as a part of, of how we move to a lower carbon economy. So that's going to be a big, big challenge for the system. She comes in at a time when, as you say, there are real shifts going on in world trade. And one of them we saw just this week where the European Union statistics organization, Eurostat, reported that for the first time, China now has replaced the United States as the largest trading partner with Europe. What is the significance of that, and particularly for the Biden administration, as they come in to try to implement their own trade policy? Yeah, you know, you're starting to see now a lot of analysis of how just how badly Trump's China strategy really backfired on him. I mean, not only is our overall trade deficit much, much bigger than before he took office, but our exports to China actually are down significantly from before the trade wars. Uh, China has recovered and unfortunately is proving itself more likely, uh, absent some new strategy by the Biden administration, to become a more powerful force in world trade than the U.S. They have a new trading arrangement with Asia, as you know, this RCEP agreement. They even have this new investment deal with the EU. And the effect of that would be to significantly endanger our global lead on innovation and technology development if we're not able to push back now and come up with a new approach uh, that puts the U.S. back in the driver's seat. And you know, protectionism, the old Trump trade war approach, is simply not going to give us the answers we need to compete in the world and to lead the WTO system. They're going to have to figure out how to make peace with our best allies and create a new alliance of what I would call the democratically elected market economies to push back on China and start insisting on uh, changes in, in China's practices. Uh, and for the U.S. to be able to preserve it, its technological and innovative edges, we have to run faster than the Chinese uh, here at home. So, Rufus, you just put your finger on the two that I've heard most out of the new administration, which is unfair practices and technology. Uh, but does it make it more difficult for the Biden administration to bring the Europeans on board if, in fact, their largest trading partner now is China, not the United States? Well, we can still do a lot to strengthen our relationship with Europe and, and to reverse that situation. We ought to get behind, get beyond some of the old disputes we've had festering between the U.S. and Europeans for decades, like the Airbus Boeing dispute, um, you know, like disputes over agriculture and other things, and move towards a, a more coordinated approach, not just with the Europeans, with Japan, with right. other democratically elected market economies in Asia and in Latin America. And if we do that, I think we can, you know, the U.S. still has very robust trade and investment flows with Europe. But the Europeans lost a lot of confidence in the U.S. during the Trump era and are, you know, they don't right. want to be in a situation where they are going to face unpredictable and sudden yeah. kinds of actions like Trump was taking against yeah. them. Uh, and yeah. Biden is going to have to work on how we give them those assurances while at the same right. time addressing some of our concerns about them. Right. Thank you so much, Rufus. Always great to have you with us. That's Rufus Yerksa. He's former deputy director general of the WTO, and now he's president of the National Foreign Trade Council. Coming up, Wall Street's commitment to diversity. 
Goldman Sachs, just the latest lender to throw its weight behind HBCUs. Asahi Pompe, she is Goldman Sachs Global Head of Corporate Engagement and Goldman Sachs Foundation President, joins us with more. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. President Biden has made further progress in eliminating racial injustice a priority, seeking to build on the civil rights progress of the 1960s. They saw it happen. And so it generated the, the, uh, the Voting Rights Act, it generated the Civil Rights Act, and he called the Second Emancipation. We have a chance now, a chance now, to make significant change in racial disparities. Wall Street is seeking to help in the quest for racial justice. And our colleague, Shanali Basak, is here now with one of the Wall Street executives who is leading the effort. Shanali? Thank you, David. And thank you to Asahi Pompei, Goldman Sachs's global head of corporate engagement. Asahi, I know we're here to talk today about your $25 million, Goldman's $25 million commitment to historically black colleges. But I do want to set the stage here nationally a little bit because we have President Joe Biden and his commitment towards racial equality. How is that? Do you believe that it in some way is pushing the financial industry forward in a faster way? You know, I certainly think it's pushing the financial industry in a faster way. I think there is a fundamental realization that, you know, racial equity can, uh, can no longer wait. As I was coming up in the industry, Sonali, very often uh, the question would be, where is the pipeline? You know, show me the black talent and I'll hire them. I think there's a fundamental shift. There's an understanding that the talent is there. Uh, HBCUs for generations have been producing titans of industry. Vice President Biden, Keisha Lance Bottoms, Spike Lee, and the list goes on. And it's a matter of tapping into that talent and really widening our aperture. Well, part of this is interestingly structured, too. You're having Goldman's Young Bankers teaching a class, really. You're teaching financial literacy at historically black colleges. How do you expect that to make that pipeline a bit bigger? Well, in terms of the program, it's a $25 million commitment to historically black colleges and universities and their students. And so the program is a four-month immersive, intensive program on finance fundamentals, where these 125 students will learn how to value a company, how do you compare companies, how do you do a model. They'll get a front row seat with the head of investment banking, the head of sales and trading, the head of research. And in addition, Sonali, as you mentioned, They'll also be paired with an analyst that currently works at Goldman Sachs to really tell them the ins and outs of what it's really like to work on Wall Street. So a lot of this comes down to the pipeline. Uh, we still hear after so long that people are having a hard time with that pipeline. Uh, do you think that this could become a matter of law at some point, that there will be quotas here if the industry doesn't move fast enough to fix this issue? You know, I think, you know, corporations are making aspirational goals and they're publishing those goals. So it's a matter of setting aspirational goals around hiring and recruiting, being public and transparent around what those goals are, and then driving towards execution to really deliver on that. That's the formula that we've been following at Goldman Sachs. In particular, in terms of our recruiting from HBCUs, we've set a goal of doubling the number of HBCU analysts that we hire by 2025. And so you'll see that happening more and more, which is set a goal, publish it, and diligently hold yourself accountable to really meeting that goal. It's not I really think will change the trajectory and ultimately, hopefully, the face of Wall Street. Uh, you know, and the numbers on Wall Street are still pretty stark here. I mean, how, how much further can you go this year? You know, I think there's significantly more than we can go. I, I'll tell you, share with you now, how, how I started on Wall Street. Um, I uh, got an internship at a small investment bank, um, you know, several years ago, and I really didn't see Wall Street as a place for me. Um, I really didn't think as a poli-sci major, you know, I thought you had to be a finance major to really work on Wall Street. And so part of this is around showing what's possible, that it's not just Howard or Harvard, it's Howard and Harvard. It's Spellman and Smith in terms of our hiring. And I think if you see that and drive that with consistent effort over time, it could really make a, a significant difference in catalyzing change on the street. And we just have a few more seconds here, Sahi. What was the one thing you would want to see from President Joe Biden on his equity efforts? 
you know, I think it's about sustaining the effort, Sonali. Things cannot be episodic. This cannot be a false dawn. We've got to make sure that the effort is sustained and it's a multi-year commitment mm -hmm. in order to really see progress. That was Asahi Pompey of Goldman Sachs, the global head of corporate engagement. Thank you for joining us. And David, back to you. Thank you so much to our colleague, Shanali Basak, speaking there with Asahi Pompey from Goldman Sachs with their remarkable announcement of $25 million now to be committed to historically black uh, colleges and universities across the country, something that, frankly, President Trump's administration has also uh, endorsed and backed, but now they're moving forward robustly. And, of course, we have a vice president now in Kamala Harris who graduated from one of those colleges. So it's great to have Asahi Pompey with us today. Coming up on Balance of Power, we're going to continue on Bloomberg Radio over our second hour. We're going to talk to former Secretary of Agriculture and Governor of Nebraska, Mike Johans, about the Biden approach to agriculture. It turns out that the agriculture, the farmers earned more money last year than they had done in seven years, but it looks like they're not going to get back to that level until 2030. We'll also ask him some about the possible effect on the farmers, on agriculture, of what we're seeing with the severe cold in Texas. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.